Wow, hope shines through discouragement. Hey, what if life is not a problem to be solved, but it's actually a story to be lived? What if, what if we find ourselves in the middle of a story? And if so, then it implies there's a story teller. Friends, I want to encourage you today. We are in a story and there is a storyteller and the author of our story, he knows the end. And not only that, he's writing it out even now. And I just want to encourage you today. Your story is not yet over. And so whatever you find yourself in today, I want you to be encouraged. So what if God really does his best work through our struggles and through our trials? You know, that's really what the Bible says. And if this is true, then could it be that right now, during this time, yes, this pandemic still not over, could it be that he's doing his very best work in us? And he desires to do that in you. I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Could it be that this is not just a great pandemic? This is the great opportunity for us. If it's true that God does his best work in the midst of trial and struggle and discouragement even in our lives. This is what the Bible teaches us. What if the story of Jesus, okay, so his birth, his life, his death and resurrection really is not only the greatest event that ever took place in history, but it's actually the model for life. What if that's the story that's being played out, not only throughout history, but in our own lives personally. See, if you believe this, it would stand to reason that right now, that God is at his best work in your life. Now, if you're thinking with me here, uh, you might think, well, man, if God just does his best work in, in our lives through hard times, through difficult times, if he set it up that way, that seems like God is rather harsh, maybe even unkind, like he's a taskmaster. But what if the problem's not with God? What if the problem is us? What if the problem is that God actually does his best work during times of trial and struggle because it's then that our self-sufficiency, our self-reliance comes to an end? What if only when we come to the end of our rope do we actually take hold of his? You know, the Bible would teach us that's exactly what life is all about. That's what's happening. And so if you find yourself discouraged today, if you're finding yourself going through a very challenging season, I want you to be encouraged. What if that is exactly how we grow in the kingdom of God? What if we're in a story and the writer of our story is good and wise and he is kind and he knows everything you're going through right now? Friend, I want to encourage you today. What if life is not about getting all the answers, but in fact, it's about getting God and discovering that he's enough? regardless of what comes our way. So I want to just gather around today. Uh, I wish I could be right there with you uh, as your pastor. Just step into that space wherever you are and be right there. I mean, eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart, knee to knee. You might be thinking, well, hey, I'm, I know I'm in my pajamas. Well, okay, no, that'd be okay. I wish I was right there with you just to talk to you personally. I'd ask this question. How are you doing? How are you doing really? And, and before God, we can be honest, maybe before loved ones, how are you doing today? I want to encourage you. And what I mean by that is not that you'll, you'll feel some greater sense of courage or even warm, you know, kind of fuzzy feelings when I'm done. I'm talking about truth from God's word that will penetrate your heart and combat the fears, the discouragement, perhaps the anxiety, even depression that you're facing in these days. Clearly, America is discouraged. According to Pew Research, you, know, you, you could probably guess, nearly half of us agree that the pandemic has impacted our mental health in some negative way. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, well, what are the other half of you, <laughs> like, well, you're just, you're just chilling through all this? And then there's a third of us, according to research, that we, we've, we would say we've experienced high levels of emotional, uh, mental distress during this season. And of course, that's highest among those who are going through financial, economic challenges and struggles, and those who are especially concerned about their health. Some of you, like me, you're, 
you're, you're just tired and weary. Uh, some have called it decision fatigue. If you're leading anything, if you're guiding an organization or a church or company, or if you're a leader in your home, we're all making decisions. I, I read this week uh, about moral fatigue. That is to say, quite, you know, a, 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 making decisions that are right or wrong morally. We're wrestling with what is the right thing to do. And we're all struggling with things on our daily, in our daily lives, right? Should I go do this? Can I go out to eat? Can I not? They might seem like small decisions. We don't normally have to make these decisions. Should I go meet that friend of mine? Or can I not? Can I see a parent? Do I need to wear a mask? Well, I've got to wear a mask. So we've got all of these different decisions that we're trying to make. What about my children? What about school starting, not starting? It's just so frustrating, so discouraging. So let's just offer, as we start here, just a mass confession. Uh, discouragement knows no boundaries. It doesn't matter where you're from, you know, your, your, your culture or your, your creed or your, 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 your community. Uh, discourage impacts all of us. And I just want to say today that it's okay. If you're discouraged today, uh, join the club. I, I praise God that, the, that His Word that He's given us, the Bible, is replete with stories of those who have been discouraged, who live discouraged in many ways. If you know stories of the Bible, you think about Abraham, for instance, right? Moses, wow. What about Job, Jonah? Uh, the, just, I mean, expressions of discouragement and despair even. I think about Peter or Paul. Could I say it? Even Jesus, surely he experienced uh, discouragement in his life. He had the most dysfunctional staff you could ever have. Clearly, he was constantly trying to get people to join him and to join what he was up to in the world. So I'm saying all this, it doesn't matter where you're from. Discouragement hits all of us. I just want to remind you, particularly those of you who are part of, of Park City's Baptist Church, we started this pandemic way back in March, and we said, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. That's been the focus of our entire year. And we started this period of time with this passage out of Matthew 11, um, where Jesus says this, come to me. And I just want to bring this to you today again. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. This is my hope today as we enter into his word. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now we've entitled this particular series, Not Okay. The idea is this, it's okay to not be okay. And it's, it's time for us to just to come clean and say, I am not doing real well. If this is the case for you, we're gonna talk about discouragement today. We're gonna to talk about uh, just exhaustion. Some of us, are, again, just exhausted. We're going to talk about uh, anxiety. Anxiety often then leads to depression. And we're going to hear from different members like Anna this series. We're going to talk about what it is to struggle with these things. So I want you today to turn to first, uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in this first message of this series. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 1 through 18. While you turn there, uh, Paul has been talking about the good news of Jesus Christ. You're going to see that the first part of this uh, passage, 2 Corinthians 4, grab a Bible and turn there uh, with me. And the first, his first word is therefore. We see this over and over again in a lot of his writing. He's assuming we've read everything up to this point. Of course, we haven't. But let me just kind of set this up for us um, before you get to the text there. You know, maybe pre-pandemic. Uh, life was going pretty well with you. Paul's been talking about the gospel, not that things are going great in Corinth, but he's saying, hey, Jesus has done all that he needs to do. He's lived the perfect life for us, died on the cross for us, taken our shame and punishment. He set us free if we'll receive that free gift of grace. He said, this is the life he's called us to, a triumphant life in him. Maybe you were living that way. Kind of life was going pretty well, celebrating your life in Christ. And you were just crushing it. Maybe you're just cruising along, running your race, and then on the backstretch, something happened. I think all of us have felt that. Something snapped. Uh, we just went down. You know, the, the race ended. Some of you may know the story, now famous, kind of infamous story of Great Britain's um, runner, Derek Redmond, back in the 92 Olympics in Barcelona. The whole world's watching. He's running the 400 meter, and he was favored to win the race or do very well, at least medal. 
So he's about halfway through the race, and some of you may have seen this. He immediately pulls up. His hamstring snaps in the middle of a race. He, he goes down onto his knees. His dreams are shattered. The race seems to be over, right? Well, some of us have felt that way through this. Maybe you feel like that today. Maybe you've fallen and uh, you feel like you're done. Maybe you feel like you're, uh, some decisions that you've made have, have now meant that your life is a failure. Or you feel that, that decisions others have made have caused you to end the race. Here's the first thing I want you to see. Because this is where Paul begins. This is what he's been talking about. The story does not end with the fall. The story does not end with the fall. The biblical story, of course, does not end with the fall in Genesis 3. But your story does not end with the fall. And we've all fallen. We've all failed. But some of us have truly come to believe, even apply this cancel culture to our own lives. As if we've been canceled. As if some failure has disqualified us. Friends, listen. Whatever you've gone through, sins of your past, failures of the past, or even struggles in the present, don't disqualify you. You've not been canceled by God. So if you're discouraged today, I want you to look at this passage of Scripture, an amazing text that we're going to look at here. In verse 1, he says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. This is where he says, hey, be encouraged. Don't lose heart. Take heart is what some translations say. The word, in fact, uh, encourage is what we're seeking to do today. What Paul says, be encouraged, take heart. The word actually in, okay, so the word in, encourage comes from a Latin word core, C-O-R. Core means heart. So it's in the heart. He's coming to your heart and he's saying, come on, what's best in your heart? Take courage, take heart and be encouraged. He's talking about the good news of the gospel and all that God has done for us. And then he says, hey, take heart, okay? Be encouraged. And then he says in verse 2, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Now, what is he saying? This is so important. If we're going to face discouragement, we cannot just put God's word aside. And he says, don't distort God's word. False teachers are discrediting Paul and he's not discouraged. He has a clear call of reconciliation. He knows what he's about. But here's, what's ha here's what happens for so many of us. We're listening to so much noise in these days. I just want to ask you, are you listening to God's word? And I know you might think, well, I am now. That's why I'm here. Listen, are you in the Word regularly? If not, you've got a million voices coming at you. And I would say to you, no wonder you're discouraged. Because it's through God's Word that we discover the truth. And he says, we've got to stay focused on the truth. Why are you discouraged today? Maybe you're discouraged because you've been seeking to, to share the gospel or really encourage, uh, teach, and guide. Maybe your children. Maybe your friend. Maybe it's someone in your family. You just want them to come to faith so badly. Maybe you've been trying to reach them uh, for the Lord and you're discouraged. Well, look at verse 3 and 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. What is he saying here? You may, you may think, well, oh, if I were a better witness, this person would come to faith. Or, you know, truthfully, if I just loved them better, I'm not, I'm not loving them well, or that person makes me a little crazy, I still want them to come to Christ, but I have not been a good witness. Or they just know me too well. You might think I'm discouraged because I'm not enough. Look at what it says in verse 4. In their case, the God of this world was blinded, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, this sounds discouraging all the more, but listen, should change the way we pray. Here's the thing. All of us are born with spiritual blindfolds. And that's not, not to say that, that we don't share Christ with everyone, but a lack of love on your part or maybe the lack of faith in a loved one's heart is not your fault. You see, we all have these spiritual blindfolds. But listen, this should, this should change the way we pray. This is what Paul is saying. The prayer should become, Lord, remove the blindfolds. Now we know how to pray, right? No one has ever been saved because of your good works, but because of the finished work of Jesus. If we are truly seeking 
to share the gospel. We get discouraged for a lot of different reasons. Maybe it's ministry. Maybe it's trying to serve others well, but they're just not coming along. Just be encouraged today. Paul's saying, don't give up. Don't give up. Look at verse 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Christ, Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as, as your servants. For Jesus' sake, don't miss this. He says that there is this God of this world there in verse 4, and he's now saying, hey, listen, there's an enemy at work. We don't proclaim ourselves and our good work, but instead there is an enemy at work, and he's not only at work in unbelievers' lives, he's, he's at work in our lives. He seeks to discourage us. In fact, I read this this week. I thought it was real interesting. Discouragement is his most subtle tool. So the story goes like this. It was advertised that the devil was going to take all of his tools out and lay them out for sale. On the day of the sale, uh, the tools were placed out for public inspection. People came by. Each one was marked with a price. There were uh, treacherous lots of implements and tools out on the table. Hatred, envy, jealousy, pride, lying, doubt, all of those things. And apart from all of those was one set over to the side. It was a well-used tool it was well worn but priced very high one of the purchasers asked hey what's that tool and the adversary said oh that's that's discouragement he says why why was it priced so high and he said because it's more useful than all of the other tools if i can use this tool on the heart of an individual, here's what happens. I can pry open the heart with this tool. I can get deep down inside the person's heart. And with that one, I can get them to think or to hear or to go anywhere I want them to go. See, now once inside, I can make him or her do what I choose. The tool was so badly worn uh, because it had been used more than in any others. And, and, and since so few people realized that it belongs to Satan. They hardly paid any attention to it. And the story goes that the devil, his price was so high, no one would buy it and he would never sell it. Friend, he's at work in your heart today. We've got to stop and acknowledge that there's an enemy and his tool is one of discouragement. But you need to remember today that we can overcome in Christ. Look at verse 6. He says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. This is a reference to Genesis 1, creation. He's saying now there's a new creation. He has shown his, in, in, in our hearts, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He, he says, now we have this new light that's in us. Now he's going to use this analogy. Hang on to this. This light in us, a picture of conversion, okay? Now the light of Christ in us, and it's changed everything. Our future's secure. Our worth is found in Him. We're defined by His love. The story doesn't end at the fall. But listen, the story doesn't end in the middle. You are in the middle of your story. Be encouraged today. Whatever you're walking through, God is writing a story. You may be walking through a difficult chapter, but listen, it may be a terrible chapter, but it's just one chapter. It's a great book, but this is not the entire story that you're walking through. Hold on to that. Hang on during this time. You're somewhere in the middle. Listen, there's purpose in the middle. There is meaning in the middle. There's a miracle in the middle. If you hold on to him, look at verse seven. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. What is this treasure? The treasure is the light of the gospel. We have his love in us now. This transformation of heart, the gospel changes us. Why are we so frail in the midst of it all? Why are we so weak and broken? So that, it says, God can show his power through us. He can show his glory. It's why Anna said earlier, my, my, my hope is found in Jesus. She said hope becomes more real during times of, of discouragement. Think about it. Discouragement and Christian hope, she says, go together. In fact, hope shines through discouragement. Watch this. Light shines through broken vessels. So when we bring our brokenness to him, the light shines. The light of the gospel shines 
through your brokenness. Friend, whatever you're going through, the struggle, the challenge, yes, the discouragement, others are watching. Others are watching, and they're seeing that light shine through, and that's how God does His best work. But don't miss this. There's only one prerequisite for a vessel that God will use. The kind of jar he's looking for. Some of us might think, well, well God wants me to, you know, he like wants me to be a gold vessel. I mean, don't have to bring my best in. I, I should be a gold vessel. And we're trying to work harder to get better. He wants me to have like a sweet handle on it. He wants me to, he wants a vessel that's easy to pour. I'm not that easy. I'm difficult for him to work with. He wants one with a beautiful design. I'm, I'm just not that beautiful. Listen, there's one prerequisite that God requires of the vessels that He wants to use. And here it is. He wants His vessel to be empty. That's the only prerequisite that He's got. If you're full of yourself, if we're full of anything but Him, He can't use us. We have nothing but the treasure of the gospel filling us up. The transformative work of Christ in us. Look at verse 8. This is why we can say, we are afflicted in every way but not crushed perplexed, but not driven to despair. Watch, here, here it is. You can be discouraged. Don't let your discouragement become despair. We're persecuted, we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Again, do you feel discouraged today? There is an enemy, friends. In his book, perhaps you've read uh, Screw Tape Letters, or maybe you know the story. C.S. Lewis wrote uh, this, the Screw Tape Letters, and in it, the senior devil, Screw Tape, is writing letters to Wormwood, his his little understudy. He's given him instruction on how to deal in one section uh, is fascinating with how to deal with man's disappointment and discouragement. And it's eye-opening. Listen to this. He says, work then, he's writing Wormwood, on the disappointment or anticlimax, isn't that what happens and creates discouragement, which is certainly coming to the patient, okay, the person he's assigned to, during his first few weeks in this great endeavor. The enemy, that's God, allows this disappointment to occur on the threshold of every human endeavor. The enemy takes this risk because he has a curious fantasy, he calls it, of making these little disgusting human vermins, okay, he doesn't like us much, um, what he calls free lovers, what God calls us, free lovers or servants, sons is the word he uses. Wormwood Wormwood says, uh, the enemy, God, wants them to grow and trust him and not their feelings and 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 so screw tape writes him and he says hey herein lies our opportunity he says if we feel that we are on our own without god then emotions take over he's saying this is true about humans human emotion takes over discouragement sadness weariness entitlement can lead us to so much discouragement so he says And there lies our opportunity. But also, he tells him, remember, there lies the danger. If once they get through this initial dryness successfully and become much less dependent, watch this, on emotion and therefore much much more on God and who He is, they're much harder to, to tempt. See, what happens to far too many of us is we let our emotion take over a lot more than we do the truth of who God is, the facts of who He is. It's why Anna said earlier, hold up what you feel up against the truth of what you know about God, emotions up against truth. So critical. The reality is the truth of what God has shown me. The foundation of our hope then is not our emotions. It's found in Him. So if you're not feeling so good today, if you're discouraged today, be encouraged. Turn to Him. You can trust Him. This is why difficult times, even even discouragement can be a gift. Because if we lean on who God is and not on how we feel, we can take heart and we can overcome, you see, as we trust in Him. This is why discouragement, can I say it? Can bring about all kinds, all sorts of good things in our lives. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it's exactly what Paul says in Romans 5. Maybe you know this famous passage. He says, since we've been justified, okay, we rejoice with hope in the glory of God. And then he says in verse 3, he follows that with saying, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Say, what? Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame. 
Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, our trials, our suffering ultimately stirs up this hope in us so that we can be encouraged. Now, back to chapter, uh, chapter 4 there, 2 Corinthians again. Verse 8, he says then, we're afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. And we're, 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 we're perplexed, but we're not despairing. We're persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, and not destroyed. So look at this. Discouragement comes to all of us, but we must draw a line at some point. And that's what I want you to do today. Say, I will fight this thing. I will claim the truth of who God says He is. I was talking to a 13-year-old girl recently, just a couple of weeks ago, who had just come to Christ. And she was talking about how she doubts and she struggles with doubt. And I assured her, everybody doubts. Any thinking person doubts. But then I told her this. I said, listen, uh, don't let your doubt become unbelief. And I explained it this way. Uh, doubt is to unbelief what temptation is to sin. Right? We're all going to be tempted. Don't let your temptation become sin. Let your temptation become an opportunity not for sin, but for obedience. Don't let your doubt become disbelief. Let your doubt lead you to greater belief and understanding. Seek answers. Seek Him. I'd say the same thing about this discouragement. Don't let discouragement become despair. We're crushed, but we are not forsaken. We may be going through tough times. We're beat down, but we are still here. And God continues to work in our lives. Look at verse 10. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. He's explaining this is what's going on. So that, here it is a phrase again, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. Watch this. Before resurrection, there's death. This is the model of life, right? This is the life of Christ in us. He's saying what they did to Jesus, okay, happens to us. Why wouldn't it? And what Jesus did among them, his resurrection, all right, happens in us too. And so they see his life in us. Look at verse 11. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. So that, he keeps using that phrase, for the purpose that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal bodies. His life is revealed through us. How? Well, through suffering. Through, yes, even discouragement. Verse 12, so death is at work in us, but life in you. So that the life of Christ may be expressed through me. So my death, discouragement, suffering becomes life for someone else. You say, but wow, what a price to pay. That's how the kingdom works. As you walk through struggling times, difficult times, you're inspiring others and pointing them to Jesus. Parents, think about this. As spouses, think about this. Friends, think about this. Have you ever watched someone go through something really difficult and it just inspires you so much? It happens all the time. It's what every great film is about, right? Every great story. Someone is watching you. And, and it's in these moments. See, maybe you're discouraged because someone you love is dying. Or, or, or maybe someone has died. Well, look at verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believe and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. You know, he's, he's drawing from Psalm 116.10. He says, hey, I believed it so I said it. That's a good word for us. I believed it so I said it out loud. Then look, because we think, we postulate, we cross our fingers, we really hope something will happen. No, no, no. We know, he says in verse 14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into His presence. He, he's drawing again from Psalm 116 where it says, precious is the death of one of His saints. Why precious? Because they come into His presence. So the point is this, if the worst thing were to happen, we might think death is the worst of all things. Listen, he's saying, no, 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 no. Even that doesn't end the story. Look at verse 15. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. See, maybe you're discouraged because your physical body's breaking down. Well, verse 16, don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Something is happening in you, friend, that you cannot see. What looks like death is actually 
you coming to life. That's how this works in the kingdom because the story doesn't end at the fall. The story doesn't end at the middle. Watch this. The story doesn't end at the end. Our storyteller has written a story and he is eternal. And our story is eternal. And in verse 17, he says why this should impact our lives. For this light momentary affliction, for in the light of eternity, life is that. Affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Even in our discouragement, don't give up because God is doing a new thing that will last forever. In verse 18, he then says, as we look not to the things that are seen. So here's our posture in all of this, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, they're fleeting, they're here and they're gone, but the things that are unseen are eternal. There is so much more going on that you cannot see. The story is being written. Fix your eyes on the eternal and, and, and focus on what you cannot see. You say, how do I do that? We've talked about it today. You look at God. You, you know His Word. You trust in Him. If not, you will be discouraged. Stay in His Word. Stay focused. And I want to challenge you to be an encourager as well. As I've sought to be that in your life today. Some of you may remember not too many years ago, Amy Winehouse was an extraordinarily gifted, talented singer, vocalist, and a deeply troubled soul. And she joined what's called the 27-year-old club. In Hollywood, the 27-year-old club is made up of Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Jim Morrison. The list goes on. Amy Winehouse joined it. All of them died through self-destructive behavior because they were discouraged and had no hope. I've often wondered, did Amy have anyone? Did Kurt have anyone? Did Jimmy have anyone in their lives that knew Jesus that could show them what it is to, yes, be broken like them, to be uh, walking through discouragement and pain, and yet for them to see the light of Jesus shine through? I want you to pause for a minute and think with me. One application of this message is not about you. It's about someone else. Who do you know that needs encouragement? Who do you know that needs to know that God loves them? Friend, life is too short not to reach out. And we're all being discouraged and we all need encouragement. Who do you know? Give them a call. Send them a text. Better give them a call. Visit them if you can. Tell them that they're loved. Bless their lives. Friend, if you're sad because of situations in your life right now, that's okay. Students, if you're sad that school's not going the way you want it to go, your activity, your sport, it's not happening. Listen, sadness is the soul's way of saying that mattered. And yet today, I want you to see that grief and hope can coexist. Exhaustion and hope can coexist. Even depression and hope can coexist. Discouragement. And hope can, go, can coexist. Remember, the story doesn't end at the fall. Derek Redmond got back up. He started hopping on one leg to try to finish the race while the others had already finished in record time. Out of the stands came a man who came running towards him. The security guards tried to stop him. He explained, I'm his father. And he came out. Maybe you've seen this or saw it when it happened came over to Derek as he was hopping toward the finish line. And his father grabbed him. And he said later, he said, son, he told him, son, you don't have to do this. But Derek just continued on. He was determined now that his father was with him, he had a new strength. And while all of the people in the stands stood to their feet, Derek went along weeping into his father's shoulder. And his father holding him up helped him cross the finish line and finish the race to a cheering crowd that could not believe what they saw. And friend, this story pales in comparison to what God has in store for us. Remember today, your story doesn't end at the fall. Your story doesn't end in the middle. And your story doesn't end in the end. Jesus has come to us. 
God stepped out of the stands on to our playing field, into our lane. He's reaching out to you today. He's taking you by the hand. And if you'll trust him, he wants to go with you to finish the race that he's called you to. A storyteller has stepped into your story. And he's going to walk with you until the very end. And even then, it's not the end. I want us to pray together as we close. Friend, just give your, your life and your heart to him. What are you discouraged about today? You've been thinking a lot about that over this time. Just lay it before him. Trust him. What do you need to say to him right now? Maybe you need to receive his grace. Friend, by faith you receive the one who stepped into your arena, into your lane, who's come into your life. He's already finished the race for you. It is finished. Now he says, join me to glory. Will you trust him? And just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for forgiving me. I give you my life. And I want to finish the race with you. Lord, we give you our lives. We praise you for who you are. And we thank you that you've encouraged us today by your spirit. We're going to live in this encouragement throughout the coming week, even as we reach out and encourage others. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.